the Ethiopian eunuch is somewhat of a minor character in the New Testament, though he is a familiar character. N.B. Hardiman based one of his famous tabernacle sermons delivered in the Ryman Auditorium in the spring of 1922 on the conversion of a civil official, speaking of that of the Ethiopian eunuch. In the churches of Christ, we have heard many sermons about how Philip the evangelist joined himself to the Ethiopian's chariot, Acts chapter 8, verse 29 and 31, and how that Philip preached unto him Jesus, Acts chapter 8, verse 35. We've heard how the, Ethiopian, how the Ethiopian eunuch responded to that message, saying, Look, here is water. What hinders me or prevents me from being baptized? We've read many times from the account in Acts chapter 8 how that both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him, and then they both came up out of the water. We know how that the Ethiopian eunuch when he obeyed the gospel, went on his way rejoicing. But did you know that there is another Ethiopian eunuch in the Bible that is not as familiar? A man that is virtually unknown. This man saved the life of Jeremiah the prophet. His name means the king's servant. Thus, what he is known by is more of a description than it is a name. Kind of like in Andy Griffith when the townsmen would say, Howdy, Sheriff. They would be referring to Andy as Sheriff, though that would not be his name, but that would be the reference. Or like the Beatles who sang, Please, Mr. Postman. This man's name means the king's servant, but it's not really a name as much as it is a title. His story is in Jeremiah chapter 38 and chapter 39. He is both the Old Testament Ethiopian eunuch and the Old Testament Good Samaritan. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 12 informs readers about eunuchs saying, For there are eunuchs who are born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. And there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. The Ethiopian eunuch of the Old Testament we know was a foreigner, made a eunuch by men because of what is directed to us in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 1. The castration of a Hebrew was forbidden. Jeremiah was a eunuch as well for the kingdom of heaven. Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 2, he was commanded by God, You shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons nor daughters in this place. But this evening we want to focus our time and attention on that Old Testament Ethiopian eunuch. I said that he saved the life of Jeremiah the prophet. So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 38 and chapter 39 to see who this little-known Bible character was and how he came to save Jeremiah. As we open Jeremiah chapter 38, we find Jeremiah preaching the same message that he's been preaching for some time now. Jeremiah chapter 38, beginning in verse 2, Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and safe alive. Thus says the Lord, the city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. If we hold our place there in Jeremiah chapter 38 and look back for just a brief moment at Jeremiah chapter 21, we find in verses 9 and 10 of Jeremiah 21 similar wording. It's the preaching of Jeremiah previously to the same group of people. He said, He who dwells in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out and falls away to the Chaldeans who are besieging you will live, and he will have his own life as booty. For I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. 
God was going to deliver Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, into the hand of the Babylonians who would besiege that city and destroy it by fire. But he wanted the people to be saved. And in order for that to take place, he gave them certain commands. The only way in which anyone could save his own life would be to surrender to the captivity of the Babylonians. All who stayed in the city would surely die by sword or by starvation or by disease. So Jeremiah preached to them. Jeremiah's preaching had little effect on the king or its people as we find in Jeremiah chapter 37 verses 1 and 2. Now Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had made king in the land of Judah, reigned as king in place of Coni, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord which he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. As was often the case when people do not listen to the message from God, it made the messenger of God many enemies and the prophet was falsely accused of trying to desert to the enemy therefore he was arrested he was beaten and he was thrown into a vaulted cell for many days Jeremiah chapter 37 verses 11 through 16 the prophet was the object of hatred because he urged Jerusalem to submit to God's commands eventually Jeremiah would have found himself being moved to a better location. But soon thereafter, new charges were levied against him. And the accusation this time was that the words that he was preaching, the words that he was giving to the people, were discouraging both the army and the citizens of the city of Jerusalem. Back in Jeremiah chapter 38, this time we look at verse 4. Then the official said to the king, Now let this man be put to death. Inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in the city and all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not speaking, not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. King Zedekiah, or yes, King Zedekiah would not interpose on Jeremiah's behalf. Rather, he would give the men their leeway. Verse 5. As he said, so, Z so King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So it was that Jeremiah's enemies did as they wished. They threw him into a cistern, planning to leave him there and allow him to starve to death. Their act of putting him into the cistern, they lowered Jeremiah down by ropes into the cistern, and upon arriving inside, Jeremiah discovered that the cistern had no water in it, only mud which he sank into. Josephus reported in his Antiquity of the Jews, book 10, chapter 7, section 5, that Jeremiah stood up to the neck in the mire that was in that cistern. We look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 52 through 60, and we see there a description of the prophet's situation. The opening words of that section of Scripture read, My enemies without cause hunted me down like a bird. They have silenced me in the pit, and I have placed a stone on me. Jeremiah was in the pit of despair, one might say. Verse 55 of Lamentations chapter 3 speaks of Jeremiah's cry from that pit. He said, I called on your name, O Lord, out of the lowest pit. And the Lord heard Jeremiah's cry. The Lord not only heard Jeremiah's cry, but the Lord answered Jeremiah's cry. And the answer to that cry is found in the first words of Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse number 7. But ebed melech But ebed melech Here was God's answer to the pit of despair. A kindly service of a fellow servant, Ebed Melech. We begin reading Jeremiah chapter 38, this time verse 7. But Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, while he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. Now the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin, and Ebed Melech went out 
from the king's palace and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom you have cast into the cistern. And he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take thirty men from here under the authority and bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to the place beneath the storeroom. And he took from there worn out clothes and worn out rags and let them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, Now put these worn out clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. And so it was that there was no real reason delivered as to why Ebed-Melech would give such a service to Jeremiah. There's no indication that Ebed-Melech was some kind of special friend of Jeremiah, though he may have well heard the preaching of Jeremiah, maybe on several occasions. And when he heard in the palace of the king that Jeremiah had been put into the cistern, he knew that he had to act. And so he went to the king, and he pleaded on Jeremiah's behalf. The king listened to the pleading of Ebed-Melech, and he gave him permission to to lead a rescue party. So he took some 30 men and he went down and gathered up some old clothes and old rags to pad the ropes and went down to the cistern. Then they pulled Jeremiah from the muddy mess that he was in. Thus Jeremiah was rescued by the hands of Ebed-Melech. Meanwhile, the king was sinking in his own mire of wrong decisions. We can read about these in Jeremiah chapter 38, beginning in verse 14. Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that it was in the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I am going to ask you something. Do not hide anything from me. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, Will you not certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. But the king Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret, saying, As the Lord lives who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hands of those men who are seeking your life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, Then you will live. This city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given over into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Then King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans, for they may give me over into into their hand, and they will abuse me. But Jeremiah said, They will not give you over. Please obey the Lord in what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you and you may live. But if you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has spoken and shown me. Then behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And those women will say, Your close friends have misled and overpowered you. While your feet were sunk in the mire, they turned back. They will also bring out all your wives and your sons of the Chaldeans to the Chaldeans, and you yourself will not escape from their hand, but will be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned with fire. Once again, Jeremiah tried to convince the king to surrender to the Babylonians. By obeying the will of God in this manner, the king would not only save his own life, but he would save the lives of his family members and keep the city from being burned. But again, the king would not listen. Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 1 through 10, the city of Jerusalem 
is captured because the king would not heed the, heed the prophet's message, the command of God. As a result, Jer Jerusalem was captured. Zedekiah's family, along with the other citizens of Jerusalem, were taken captive. His own sons were executed before his eyes. Then his own eyes were gouged out, and he was put in chains and taken away to Babylon. Just as the prophet had said, the palace and the city were set on fire, and the walls of the city were broken down. But God remembers his faithful servants. He not only remembers them, but he rewards them. And thus it is revealed in Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 11 through 14, that the king of Babylon gave orders concerning Jeremiah, that he be taken and looked after, instructing that nothing harmful should be done to him. Thus Jeremiah was brought out of the guardhouse and entrusted to one of the men that he might stay there with the people. Ebed-Melech was also promised great things. He was promised protection, as we read in Jeremiah chapter 39, beginning in verse 15. Now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was confined in the courthouse of the guardhouse, saying, Go and speak to Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring my words on this city for disaster and not for prosperity. And they will take place before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that, day, on that day, declares the Lord. And you will not be given into the hand of the men whom you dread. For I will certainly rescue you, and you will not fall by the sword. But you will have your own life as booty, because you have trusted in me, declares the Lord. Notice why it was that God promised protection to Ebed-Melech. Verse 18 declares, Because you have trusted in me. Ebed-Melech, the king's servant, was also God's servant. And he deserves to be better known, being noted for his humanity. A basic feature of every Christian ought to be this respect for the value of humanity. We are to be compassionate and sympathetic and benevolent to everyone, Galatians 6 and verse 10. Ebed-Melech should be better known because of his courage. Today's climate applauds those who, are, who chastise the steadfast, the devout, and the committed. If you are viewed as standing firm in convictions of religious faith, you will be quickly accumulated with comrades of opponents. They will use every available means to intimidate you, either into compromise or else into silence. If others rise to your defense, the opponents will quickly turn and bitterly attack your supporters. Thus, it takes great courage to stand for what is right. It takes great courage to stand with those who are standing for what is right. It takes great courage to stand up for those who are attacked because those who refuse to accept compromise will accept nothing less. Let us become a modern day Ebed Melech and stand courageously with those who refuse to compromise God's clear teachings. Ebed Melech should be better known because of his great influence an influence that was attributable to his religious sympathy and his righteous sympathy concerning Jeremiah. The king respected the thoughts and the suggestions of Ebed-Melech. We ought to respect his thoughts as well. The faith of Ebed-Melech is seen in his actions, which resulted in the rescue of one of the prophets of God. He trusted in the Lord God. And our actions should demonstrate our faith and our trust in God. Our lives should show that we fear God more than we fear men and that we seek approval which comes from God above the approval given by any man. The service of Ebed-Melech should not be passed over. 
For he lifted Jeremiah out of the pit of despair, but he did so in such a way as to not bring greater harm nor greater resentment on the prophet. He used old clothes and old rags to avoid such. We see in Ebed Melech great characteristics such as humanity, courage, influence, faith, and service. We also see in Ebed Melech the opportunity to escape the disaster that is awaiting the rebellious. Ebed Melech was a servant of God, one that should become well known. His sympathetic character, his absolute trust in God, his wonderful reward bring us to an understanding of a very powerful lesson. A lesson that is illustrating a very simple fact. Those who strive to follow God's absolute will are going to find opposition. They will be thrown into the pits of despair. However, there are sympathetic believers who will come along and rescue us from the mire of despondency. Their lives are a great blessing to the godly. Therefore, we need to remember Ebed Melech's godly service and his wonderful life of sympathy, trust, and courage. Resolve that we will become as he was in these things. Reflect his sympathy to all brethren who are struggling and upholding and being steadfast in keeping the way of Christ and standing against Satan's forces to remain steadfast in our obedience, also reforming, if it be the case, that we have not demonstrated trust and courage to uphold the steadfast and to rebuke the faithless. As we turn our attention now to that of the invitation, we need to be reminded that the invitation fulfills a dual purpose. It first of all invites sinners to come in faithful obedience to the will of God, putting Christ on in baptism, while at the same time it encourages those and invites Christians, those who have previously been baptized, to continue to reform their lives, to examine their lives and reform them so that they become more in keeping with God's will. Thus it is the case that everyone who hears a message from God is encouraged to be obedient to the will of God, just as Jeremiah strived with those in his day to be obedient to the commands of God. We encourage you to be obedient to the will of God because Jesus has promised to bring salvation to those who believe in Him. Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. He's promised to turn from sin in repentance those who will come to Him. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. He's promised salvation to those who will confess Him before men. Romans 10, 9 and 10. He's promised to save those who will be baptized in His name for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. And He's promised furthermore to save those who will continually wait faithfully for His return. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 9 through 18. So it may be the case this evening that you need to put Christ on in baptism. The invitation is for you inviting you to put it off no longer, but to do what is commanded by God so that you may be saved. If you are a child of God, then the question is, are you living faithfully to His will? There is still room and opportunity afforded to you tonight to respond in obedience, seeking forgiveness for those things that are amiss in your life. Ebed Melech sets a great example for us to follow. And to follow in His steps, we need to be obedient to the will of God. Those who need to respond to the Lord's invitation tonight need to respond so even now as we stand and as we sing to encourage you.